Artemis Vegan. Uh, welcome to the Mike Hewitt Show. My name is Mike Hewitt, and we've got a studio full of people today for this show. Folks, it's going to be pretty active, but let me let me start off by saying a handful of things. First off, as you go through the show today, please feel free to give us a call. The phone number to dial in is 855-357-1911. You can also find us on Facebook, um, facebook.com forward slash the Mike Hewitt Show. And, uh, of course, obviously, I'm always going to try to get you to go look at the MikeHewittShow.com. Let me, let me run through the names that are, that are in the studio with me right now. Jim Riley is riding shotgun. Welcome back, Jim. I'm on the wing, baby. He's on the wing. Way out there. I wonder why the boat, the, the, we were kind of lift, listing a little bit, and that's maybe even listing left. Ain't going to happen. <laughs> also with us is uh, Rick, Rick Holman. You've been on the show before. Yes, I have, Mike, and thanks for having me back. Listen, folks, what you couldn't see is I had a lot of fun. He was the furthest from the microphone, so I had to reach to him first. Rick, you're involved in a lot of things. You're, you're a busy man. Well, I try to be, Mike. Uh, now that I'm pretty much retired, I spend a lot of my time in volunteer area. Okay, so Spring Lake Village, if I recall from our last meeting? Well, actually, it's Spring Lake Township. I'm on the board of directors for them as well, our board of trustees. Keeping in mind, I'm one of the business owners that wonder why I've got two sets of government thump bumping on my forehead all the time. Mike, you know like I do, that's another whole story. <laughs> that's gonna, another segment. I think we're going to get you back on someday to debate that one. Listen, also with us, folks, is Lori, who's the operations director from the Harbor Humane Harbor Humane Society, good morning. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. Now, you're busy down there. We are always very busy down there. <laughs> and also with us is Sarah, who is the development director. Is that correct? Yes, correct, development director. Very, very nice. Now, I, first off, help me out a little bit. What, what does an operations director do at uh, the Harbor Humane Society? Basically, I oversee the daily operations of the facility, um, the staff, and... Uh, just uh, make changes with standard operational procedures and implement new things at the shelter. So from my world, in my world, you'd be a general manager? Yes. Yep, that's what <laughs> I got. And what do you do? As a development director, a lot of my position is fundraising. So events, donations, donors, all that wonderful stuff that helps the shelter keep to run. Okay, listen, just, just to let everyone know, normally this is a, a political show. And in fact, today we're going to dive very, very deep into the Dewey Hill controversy over the cross should stay or the cross should go and I think that's probably going to make the phones ring quite a bit as we get into the to the to the bottom half of the segment but what caused me to say let's put these two things together is first off I really really support what you folks are doing down there okay Thanks, thank you and, and that's that's way bigger than me arguing over Dewey Hill at least for the time <laughs> being to a lot of animals so mm -hmm. give me an idea how can how can the community help what you folks are doing uh, well, obviously, we want people to come down and take a look at our, our kids, our furry kids. Um, adoptions are important to get these animals into um, their forever homes. We are always looking for volunteers. Fosters are very important to us as well. And, of course, Sarah can talk to you about needing um, money that comes in that maintains the facility and maintains our animals at the same time. Are you supported strictly by donations and by... And, and by the fees that people pay, we're, how, how's the revenue stream? How do you get money to stay in business? Yeah, we are supported fully by donations. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, so we don't receive any state or government funding for the operations of our shelter. So we rely heavily on the lovely members of the community to help us succeed and move forward in the organization. That's That's got to be a full-time job, just just getting funding to stay in operation. Mike, I think it's important for everyone to know at Harbor, we go through in an annual, on an annual basis anywhere from three to 4,000 animals per year that end up either brought in by the Ottawa County Animal Control or surrenders uh, that we, we receive. But there's uh, roughly three to 4,000 animals that we try to provide for. Um, let me ask a, a handful of the cliche questions. Is there a time period that an animal can stay with you before they're put down or before? How does that work? What, what is that? I think there's a perception in the community that that's the, that's the case. But tell me how it, 
How does it really work? Yeah, that is a perception in the community. However, um, we do not have a timeline for our animals. We have not euthanized for space in all of 2014. And right now we are really getting our transport program up to speed even better than before. Uh, partnering with new rescues and shelters so that we can get our animals saved and out of the shelter to places that have more space than we do so we can free up more space for more animals coming in. You know, I think that's huge because so many people think, okay, it's three days and it's and it's gone. Um, Absolutely Yeah, not. I think there's a picture, picture, at least I have a picture of some cute little puppy putting X's on a calendar thinking about my time's coming. <laughs> I think it's important also to note when we have an animal with behavioral issues, um, many times in the past you would find them be, being a candidate for euthanasia. Today we have a behavioralist that actually works with the animals to understand what characteristics they have and we also have a trainer for obedience to help. When we notice that there's something serious with the animal, what we attempt to do then is to find specific agencies on the outside that actually will take these animals and work with them in a great deal more than we can. He just pretty much answered my question right there. I have a do my daughter, my youngest daughter, she has a dog that can't be trusted around kids and she just had a baby. And so this dog, she, they don't want to put it down and they don't know what to do with it. They don't want to give it to another family because they're afraid that, you know, if another kid comes in the room, that dog's going to attack it and that's no good either. So if you, if she gave that dog to you, you would actually retrain it? It wouldn't be put down or? Well, actually, um, we, we did develop a behavioral team is what it is. So we have our behavioralist and we also have her assistant as well. Two people that obedience train that actually work on some of the minor issues that dogs have whether it be leash pulling or just jumping up on people. If she came in and we had an assessment done of the animal to really determine what those animals' issues are, we can make sure that that pet goes into the right fit home. So maybe that dog needs to go into a home with no other dogs and no children or children that are teenagers rather than small children. Okay. Every animal has their little quirks, so we want to make sure that those animals go into the best fit home. Listen, on, on, on the path that Oscar's asking about, um, some of the some of the other cliche stuff. We're always talking about pit bulls, and mm -hmm. in fact, of late, that's been really big in the news. So, I, I guess my my encounter with pit bulls has been opposite of what I hear. That they've been to me, and I'm not a dog expert at all, but mm -hmm. they've been floppy eared, really, <laughs> really nice animals. Mm -hmm. And so, when I right. see what I see on TV, that conflicts with what I know from life experience. But what do you folks see down there? Well, actually, I'm glad you mentioned that because this is National Pit Bull Awareness Month. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a pit bull. Most of us have pit bulls. And the reason is because pit bulls are very misunderstood for one. Um, they're very, very family oriented dogs, very people oriented dogs. One of the reasons why we have problems with them right now and so many of them is because people realize just how good a dog they are and they really bred them like crazy. But they didn't realize that this was a dog that takes a lot of work, just like a, a Rottweiler or something. They need a lot of exercise, a lot of training. They're a strong dog. And a lot of people give up on them when they start to become adults and then chain them out in their backyard. Just like any other dog, it's all in the training. It's all on who's on the other end of the leash. So these dogs are wonderful dogs, and I encourage a lot of people to go out and adopt them. How do you rate them in intelligence-wise? Are they on par with <laughs> their peers in the in the dog world? Or? <laughs> very easy to train. Um, very. You'll see a lot of eye contact with pit bulls, so they really, really want to please their owners, mm -hmm. and they really, really want to learn. And I think that desire is what's misused sometimes. Definitely. Yes. Definitely. Right. right. There is a misunderstanding about pit bulls, um, but I can tell you if you come down to the shelter, you will see a lot of pit bulls and pit bull mixes that are just ready to go into a home. Now, when you look at the, the animals in total, is it mostly dogs? Is it some cats? What's the, I mean, I've got an African gray parrot, so I... <laughs> We've had birds. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, now my African gray parrot, I wouldn't call him an attack bird. <laughs> so Sometimes he's, his linguistics are a little bit over the top, but... <laughs> uh, no, our population of animals is, is going to be generally cats. Uh, we have a lot of cats, um, and right now we do have specials on cats because we just want to get them out of the shelter and get them into homes. Um, Cats breed a lot quicker than dogs do. Uh, they breed several times throughout the year. So of course we have our kitten season in the spring and then our kitten season in the fall. A lot of people that are very compassionate towards animals and bring us all those kittens they find in their yard. So then we get 
overpopulated, and that's when we have to start moving them out of the shelter. It, it seems to me like some responsible ownership would largely solve a lot of that problem. Yeah. And a lot of those animals, I think, do some serious suffering from the circum from just just having been allowed to be to be. Oh yeah, and and you know, it, it it's all a matter of just spaying and neutering. There are a lot of resources out there to give low cost spays and neuters to the public, um, and they can call the shelter and find out what those are. Um, but it, it, if we could just get everybody spayed and neutered and bring that pet population down, um, then it would help us out a lot. Right. Now, that statement, I guess, was specifically towards uh, the cat feline, right? Yeah, we'd like to see the dogs all spayed and neutered, too. Okay. <laughs> but it would definitely help us a lot with the cats. Okay. Yes. How many animals do you have on, on hand at any one time, just average? Uh, Probably about, what, 200? Yeah, about 200, about 200. sounds about wow. right. Majority mm -hmm. cats, probably That's about 75% cats. Mm -hmm. Okay, and 25% dogs. And, and of the 25% dogs, is a majority of them pit bulls? or Most shelters across the nation, you're going to see about 60 to 65% pit bull, pit bull mixed population. Is that where people get a, get a hold of these animals, like the pit bull, and maybe the training part is a little bit more burdensome than their than they're able or equipped to deal with, or are they making it a dog mean and then can't handle it? I think um, some people, and it's not to say that they don't mean, that they mean to, but I think they um, kind of give up. They see that the dog is, is digging in the yard, they don't realize it's bored. They see that the dog is hopping the fence, they don't realize that it wants to see what's on the other side of the fence. Um, they see that the dog is strong and pulling them on a leash while they're walking, and they don't realize that all it takes is just the proper lead to get them in check. So, I think they don't um, look for some of those resources out there, like right. the obedience and behavioral training um, that's out there. Um, and that's what us shelters are for, to give them those resources to, to educate them and keep these dogs in their homes. Your, your fence analogy made me smile a little bit because <laughs> I don't think folks necessarily consider how curious-minded these animals really are. Well, and that's so, why walking the dog is so important. Right. When a dog is stuck in a backyard and it only sees the backyard, it's always going to be curious about what's on the other side of the fence. So uh, that's why a lot of them say, hey, I'm going to go. <laughs> but if you go home, take your dog for a 20-minute walk, they see what's on the other side of the fence, they see what's out there, they think, okay, now I see it. Now I can go take a nap. I had a Rottweiler that would take a nap for the rest yeah. of the night every time he got a 20-minute nap. I, I have days like that myself. <laughs> you know, I've seen enough. I'm okay now. <laughs> Jim, uh, Jim Riley, how many dogs do you have? I have none now. I had two old English sheepdogs. Did you? Not so many years ago. No? We need to get you a house full of cats and dogs, Jim. <laughs> we have that. Well, been there and done that. Very much miss my, my pups. And I also had a cat. But, Did you? Uh, um, it, it, I think the important thing for any owner, and, and I think this therein lies the, the whole reason for, for you folks even existing, is that people don't take into consideration what's necessary to be a responsible owner to there begin are, with. There are a lot of responsibility. They really are. Well, it, it, the problem is in our society, responsibility is a word that is, is too often used with a different meaning. And I would like to see something done. You're hoping for a government program to come out to your house to feed your cats and dogs? You or? know, therein lies the issue with me. <laughs> a government program to fi fix an issue. I don't know, but, but perhaps some penalties for those who have been consistently uh, irresponsible. And we just saw this horrible tragedy just a few days ago with a, a gentleman whose hands and feet were ripped from his body in the Detroit area right. by a, a, a man who was well-known not just to the community. This is in the Detroit, Michigan area. Sure. Here. Um, but he was known to the um, the police and, and law enforcement, too. So when we have those who, who can fix things just turn their noses, turn their heads, and ignore what's going on, then you, then you create problems and you create all these beautiful, wonderful little animals who are in desperate need of help. So there, you know, there are ways to fix it. Uh, uh, who knows the answer? Strangely enough, you and I actually agree on something. Mm. But for, for me, it's a huge spectrum. It goes from the folks that will train an animal to be mean purposely all the way down to I'll even driving. I'm on my way home where I'll pass a dog in the backyard where that dog is always in the backyard. And I always think to myself, why in the world would someone want a pet that they never interact with? That that I just I've Simple never answer, understood that. Because they're cute when they're little. That may be very well true. Um, some of them will justify it that it's a backyard guard dog and all kinds of other <laughs> things. But the problem with it is, as far as I'm concerned, it doesn't. It, those all those excuses don't negate the fact that the dog needs interaction. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
So yep. they are definitely living, breathing creatures, um, which is why we want to, again, go back to the education part. I would love to be able to do what I've done in other shelters and go to the elementary schools and the middle schools and really educate the children on responsible pet yeah. ownership. I think that's a great, um, great idea. I used to take my Rottweiler. He was our yeah. ambassador for bully breeds. And okay. I want to do that with my pit bull now. So they can understand that these dogs are very gentle dogs and that they are it is important to give them very and very nice can listen we're, we're almost out of time for this segment so do me a favor tell listeners how they can get a hold and how they can help you you can easily get a hold of us by visiting our website which is www.harborhumane.org there's many options on there where you can learn about adopting um, and also donations which is a big part that runs our it does run our facility we're having a nice um kennel sponsorship and room sponsorship opportunity coming up where the large dog kennels are about six hundred dollars a year and the small dog and the cat condos are about three hundred dollars a year and that is just a minimum fee of what it costs to keep an animal there. Right. Just for the basic vaccinations and spay and neutering, it's about 90 bucks to for that basic vaccination, spay and neutering. And then for cats, I want to say it's about 50 some dollars for that too. So being able to go in, what, 3,000 dogs and cats a year, that is just minimal coverage of what very, it's going to cost for very us. Very nice. Harbor Humane Society, right? Yes. Folks, reach out to these people and help them because they're doing some things that we all need. We need to have it done. I, f I appreciate you very much joining us today. And we need to do this about every three or four months. Let's do a follow-up okay. and see how things are going. Definitely agree. Thanks, folks. We'll Thank be you. back in just a few moments. You're listening to News Talk 1090, WKBZ. Be a survivor, not a statistic. Downtown Spring Lake, next to the police station. News Talk 1090 is the talk of Muskegon. Uh, welcome back to the Mike Hewitt Show. Jim Riley and I are going to delve right into a fairly big topic, and we'd like to have you join us. The call-in phone number today is 855-357-1911. The topic for the rest of this, this show today is the Dewey Hill Cross controversy. It's something that, frankly, I, I just don't get, and it, it seems to crop up from time to time. Um, just for you folks that are not familiar, in Grand Haven, a downtown across across the waterway is where the uh, the musical fountain plays. On top of that hill, which is known as Dewey Hill, there is a a cross that is erected, and it is it's erected on land that's owned by the city but leased to a Christian organization. Um, out there, they've got a hoist and they erect the the cross on. I think it's Sundays. I'm not sure what the schedule is, but it's not always up there, but periodically uh, it, it is. So well, there's a contractual arrangement, a written contract between the city of Grand Haven and a religious organization. Is it a church, do you know, or is it a... I, I understand that it is. All right. Yes. So, I, I so it's a simple... And they don't have it permanently. It, it's up uh, sometimes and, and, and not others. Typically, it's on Sundays. Now, there was an article... What drew, what drew our attention to this is that there was an article recently that appeared in the Grand Haven Tribune... Um, and it was titled Dewey Hill Cross Challenge. Um, and it's, it's a fairly good article that they wrote, but it, it outlines the fact that there's two, there's a husband and two husbands and wives set. One, one of the couples is from Norton Shore, so right here near us. The other one is from Grand Haven Township. Both of them have, have gotten together, I don't know how and I don't know their arrangement, with a Washington, D.C.-based organization called Americans United for the separation of church and state, and evidently that's a, it's a law firm. I'm going to guess it's on the neighbor, on the on par with like the American Civil Liberties, or at least that's how I interpret it. I don't know that I'm correct, but the moral of it is is that organization has pushed to not get rid of the cross, but they want to add some things to it, um, and their their overall premise seems to be that they're offended by the cross. They recognize that Ottawa County or Grand Haven, more specifically tends to be be Christian. This is my interpretations, by the way. But their letter that they'd written addressed to both the city manager and the city mayor uh, asked for the following. It said, October 26th, they want to display a sign promoting the uh, lesbian and gay, bisexual, transgender pride in marriage equality. That They want that sign to be able to be there on that location on October 26th. On December 21st, they want to sign that celebrates the winter solstice, um, solstice, I never say that word right, uh, with a sign that says the reason for the season. 
January 25th, they want to have a pro-choice display promoting reproductive freedom and women's rights. And then on May, March 22, a display promoting marriage equality and um, commemorate the first anniversary of same-sex marriage in Michigan. About what? Well, wait, I'm missing one more. Uh, finally and lastly, a sign from April 5th through May 2nd. May does, 7th. Um, I'm sorry, you were, I, right, May 7th, a sign promoting atheism and equal rights for atheists. And what well, I, wait, let me, let me just add something here that, that, that I think is quite important. Every one of these dates, with the exception of the, uh, the, the month-long issue, every one of these dates is a Sunday. And the request to put these signs up uh, is from 9 a.m. in the morning to 5 p.m. in the afternoon, which, of course, then precludes um, the use of the, of the current uh, use, which is the putting up the, uh, the cross, or it would have the cross up in conjunction with, and I don't know the, the exact size of this, but it's, it's clearly an in-your-face uh, attempt to supplant either the, the, uh, the cross itself, which, of course, is, is a long-standing tradition. And, and I, since they are utilizing a law firm, it would be interesting to find out if the contract between the church and the city of Grand Haven uh, has these dates open. I, I would suspect, in fact, that they do. And the, the issue here isn't, even though it, we know there's an overriding social issue going on, but what, we, we want to avoid confusing logical and lawful or legal. And the, the overriding issue may very well be that someone has stepped up and said that I want to use this for a different purpose. Now, in the same manner... Uh, I suppose, uh, Mike, your radio show could go uh, get involved and say that we would like to put up a sign for the, the Mike Hewitt show on Sundays, you know, up there also. So there, there are issues here that are, that are beyond just the social issue. But, but again, they're not asking for it for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or, fr- or Friday, or even Saturday. They're very specifically asking to have it put up on the dates that have traditionally been reserved for this, uh, this religious organization. It's fascinating because I live relatively the same distance to the hill as both of these two couples. And I have to tell you, I, I rarely go to a point where that's visible to me. It's, and and I'm, I'm, I'm bringing that up because they are, they're both indicating that they're, a fu- they're offended by, by the, the, the cross being there. So I'm thinking to myself, you, that means you have to drive a pretty good distance to a specific point so that you can be offended. And and it goes back to what I've said a lot of times. It seems like America is becoming a very, very offended uh, society. But but then they seem to be taking their their cause. It's wrapped around the, the signs or the, th- the promotions they want to take up. But they seem to be relying in large part on the freedom of, um, of religion as as articulated in the First Amendment. and But when I'm looking at their list of things they want to promote, those things, other than the saltus and atheism, which to me is a religion, other than that, the, the, the gay and lesbian and all of that stuff doesn't, in my mind, um, is not a religious issue. And I don't know necessarily how that, how they're, why or why they've chosen, other than to your point, with the goal of offending people. Well, I would think that uh, again. W- unfortunately, the the um, the article and the information that I have in front of me does not list who, in fact, the religious uh, organization is who is uh, who has currently been utilizing this uh, city land uh, for their cross. There's also something to do with a uh, some kind of a lift, uh, the, the usage of that lift, also. But I I. Th- I, I for conservative Christians, uh, they have a firmly stated belief that uh, up until recently was shared by the President of the United States, Barack Obama, and up until recently was shared by uh, both Bill and Hillary Clinton in that marriage should be between a man and a woman. Now, notwithstanding your agreement or disagreement with that, um, those are issues that are clearly very important to uh, uh, Christian some Christian organizations. So I think that uh, virtually every one of these, the the promotion, you know, re- reproductive freedom. Of course, the the Pope, the Catholic Church, all of those who support the Catholic Church, or at least uh, in its uh, original state, um, they they know that uh, reproductive um, 
there are limits to abortion and certain other reproductive uh, rights within the church. If you want to be a member of the church, the, the concept used to be that you would abide by what the, what the, uh, the church said. If you didn't, then you go find another religion. Exactly. I got to tell you, I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around the concept of being offended. I really am. But when I grew up on the other side of the state, um, I spent a lot of time going to, to Detroit to Henry Ford's Hospital, frankly. And on the path to get there, we would always pass a synagogue. And a number of messages in that community that we passed on the side of the large freeway that, that interacted or that promoted, if you will, to use her word, that promoted uh, the, the Jewish faith. I'm not Jewish. It never occurred to me to be offended by those messages of that community that, that for lack of better words, trumpeted their faith. I'm, I'm a little bit with Jefferson on this, and I know that the left always likes to quote Jefferson and use him with his presidency and his proverbial wall of separation letter that he was explaining his reason for not following the traditions of the first two presidents in having uh, recognition of, of uh, for instance, uh, President Washington's uh, Thanksgiving address was, was very much a, a, a statement or a reading of faith. And I, I swim my way through all of those different debates and through the history of our country. And in the end, I got to fall back to say, what does the First Amendment actually say? I hear all of the pundits on TV. I read the hard left and I read what the Christian right says and, and their and by the way, the Christian left also, and and I read, but when I actually read the words, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, and it goes on to say, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And to me, I mean, I know nowadays when a lawyer wants to write something, he's got to write a book to do it, but those two sentences, um, actually that one sentence is is pretty profound. It says a lot. To me, I, my interpretation of it is that it specifically bars federal legislation that would, that would form a national church. And I try to put myself in the position of a founder and say, what was their agenda? Why was this important? And I looked at England with the Church of England. I, obviously, that's something that they wanted to avoid. America then, as it is now, was filled with a number of different faiths and denomination of faiths. So I can understand their rationale. We don't want a federal church. But then I read the Enumerated Powers Act that, that, that addresses the fact that those things in the Constitution that, that are not power, they're left to the states or, or to the people. Now, following the Civil War, not to get too wonkish on you, but following the Civil War when the 14th Amendment was ratified, if you use that as a divider time, everything, all of the decisions that had anything to do with this topic before 1868, leaned towards, not leaned towards, was strongly in stating that, that the First Amendment barred Congress from exactly what the words say. After that, they relied on the 14th Amendment, especially in the 1920s, the Supreme Court in a number of, of findings used that 14th Amendment to say that the First Amendment also limited states and, and, uh, and uh, lower governments. Um, but from my standpoint, they go beyond that. They're no longer just shielding government from religion and keeping it out of it, but they're shielding us from it. And the hypocrisy comes when you looked at places like there's a, there's a public school in Ohio and there's one in Arizona that both allowed time outs for Muslims to leave the room and have a prayer. And I'm thinking, well, that sure does fly in the history, in the face of the history over the last um, years coming forward from the 1971 decision that was referred to now as the Lemon Test or Lemon versus Kurtzman. That's kind of how all of our modern argument has been encapsulated. Flies absolute in the face of that. And I'm thinking, where in the heck is the equality here, to use their word? And is this really just an attack on traditional America and traditional faith in America? Well, I don't think there's any question it's an attack. And, and if, notwithstanding what may or may not be in their hearts, whatever their motivation is, uh, is it's not, frankly in this case, is not the issue, because you will be happy to know that this has nothing to do with federal law. It has nothing to do with the Supreme Court of the United States. It has nothing to do with anything on a national basis. The people who are um, asking for the right to put up their banner are referencing, and it seems to me to make perfect sense, they are referencing uh, the 
City of Grand Haven's own policies, which say, quote, um, the policy on access to and use of public property, the city policy ensures decisions on use of public land requests to be, again, quote, content neutral and non-discriminatory. So quite simply, the city, and, and this fits in with the way uh, you and I and most libertarians would agree, the city has made its own laws, and its own laws say we will not discriminate on the base of, of pretty much anything for people's uh, ideas. So um, you may disagree, but the reality is, is very simple. Um, this isn't a national issue. Uh, this is, go- is going to be something that I would think uh, is a lay-down winner for the folks that want to put the banners up. Um, because uh, the discrimination at this point is at some point uh, against the non-Christians. Oscar, I think we've got a call. Welcome to the Mike Hewitt Show. Hi, Mike. It's Jim calling you. How are you? Very, very good, Jim Brown. What's on your mind this afternoon? Well, I was had a quick question for you. I pondered on this and just can't come up with a logical answer, but then again, it's about Obamacare, so maybe there isn't one. But why do we have to have both a individual mandate and an employer mandate? If that's going into effect two years later, uh, it's the law. Everyone under the individual mandate should, in fact, be insured. So why is there a need for an employer mandate? I, I think the short answer is because socialism is the politics of force. And there will be a lot of folks who say, you know what, we aren't going to participate, so go to heck. And, and, of course, Obamacare is not, not going to let folks just pass. This isn't the America that it was five years ago. I, I, let me just extrapolate a little bit on that. The rationale behind this, and, and if you recall, uh, in addition to saying if you liked your doctor, you could keep your doctor, President Obama also said that your individual annual health care insurance expenditures would go down and the net amount spent by the federal government would also go down and the amount spent by your employer. In other words, it would be less expensive to provide health care. If, in fact, the, the um, requirement for uh, employee health care wasn't in place, or at least, and of course, as you said, it hasn't fully been in place at this point, but then people, more and more people would jump onto the, uh, the Obamacare uh, exchanges, which we now know have been a disaster at every level and massively expensive to the to the tune of about ten thousand dollars subsidy per Obamacare health care policy by the federal government per per policy. Think about that. that. That was just a long-winded way of saying they're going to force you whether you like it or not. Well, they wanted exactly. to show that it made <laughs> they wanted to show that it made uh, uh, <coughs> fiscal sense, uh, even though it was mumbo jumbo. It was. When Roberts, when Roberts aligned himself with the socialists on this decision, uh, a lot of folks raced to defend him by saying, it's going to crash and burn, and he's just allowing them to prove that it doesn't work. The problem with that rationale is we are never going to get rid of this onious, nastiest economy and job-killing mess they passed on. It goes to force. Listen, Jim, stay with us. We're going to go to a break, folks. We'll be right back. Uh, welcome back to the Mike Hewitt Show with Jim Riley and I. Today we're beating up on the Dewey Hill drama, but we also took a little segue to talk about uh, Marxist care. Jim, are you still with us? I'm here. Listen, I got some calls backed up, so I gotta, I've, I've got to cut this a little bit short, but I wanted to give you a final moment. Any final thoughts on uh, how much love you are with Obamacare? Well, uh, yeah, I really love him. It's cost me $500 a month more since it took effect, so... How can, I'm all pleased. How can that be? You were a city government employer your entire life, and and so how does Obamacare impact you? How what what did, what did it do to you? Well, the city that I worked for claimed that they couldn't no longer afford the health care program and passed the cost on to the employee. So maybe it was just coincidence that it took effect the same time the individual mandate did. Yeah. It's, uh, they still provide the insurance. They just uh, upped our, well, they added a $500 a month um, uh, premium share that yep. we never had before. You know what, what we need to do? That's a whole show, Jim. Let me let me get with you. We'll follow up uh, after, actually at the end of the segment. We'll get a time scheduled. 
because I want to. You've been on the show before, and I want to pick up with what happened after the uh, limelight left the uh, the debates over uh, city funding. So, Jim, thanks for calling in, and I'll talk to you in a little bit. We'll get some details put together. Okay, thank you. Very nice, folks. If uh, if you want to call in today, we've got some time left. The phone number here is eight five five three fifty seven nineteen eleven, and we've got a call holding. Oscar, let's go. Welcome to the Mike Hewitt Show. Who am I speaking with? This is Gina. Hi, Gina. Welcome. Hi. What's on your mind I today? A, I have, um, I guess, a comment, or I wanted to comment on the uh, Grand Haven Cross okay. issue. Okay. Yep. Um, I think it's really actually kind of sad that, you know, a couple decides that they find something offensive. So instead of, you know, society today feels instead of, not looking at it, they have to go and ruin something for everyone else. I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta stop you for just a second. Listen, I wrestle, I really wrestle with this exact point you're bringing up because we have small R, by the way, people, so don't shoot at me. But we have a Republican form of government, and the laws that we have in place are designed to protect minorities and their opinions. And so when we, when, and I'm all of my politics is based on that. And this is one of those instances where I wished it was, and I wished I could support mob rule, but to a degree, they're right, except for they go the step further to say, we're offended, we want you to stop, and we want to offend you back. And I, I, don't, know that, I don't know that that was a necessary step either, but I, I certainly agree with your point that, that four people, maybe they're represented by more, I don't know. When I look at there's two Facebook groups, folks, one of them is for this and one of them is against this, and the folks that are for it by far dominate the the uh, public. And the other interesting part is if you look at the language being used, the folks that are against the cross are really vitriol um, yeah. in, in the language that they're using. Even even in the Grand Haven Tribune, if you look at the dot, dot .com version, the comments that were posted after the article, some of the folks were just mean-spirited. It was beyond... I'm offended. It was I'm an offended, and then a whole bunch of other rhetoric that went with it. Well, I, I would agree with with the caller. Um, I, I think that it it really is. It, it's sad because it's not as if any value added is going to be there. They're, they 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 purely just want to get in people's face. Um, they're not offended. Uh, most of them, I'm sure, neither one of them knew knew the situation even existed until they did extensive uh, legal research to find out uh, what was going on. And I would say this is very similar to the same kind of thing that's going on nationally. And you can come up with dozens and dozens of explanations or of, of examples of this. But but to me, the perfect one is the the, um, the federal government stepping in and attacking the name of the um, the Washington Redskins football team. Uh, they, mm-hmm. The federal government received absolutely no complaints from human beings about the name, uh, and yet now not only is there is there an attack on the uh, the ability of the Redskins football team to sell merchandise, but it's being discussed as we speak that the FCC may shut down radio stations who use the word Redskins. So, in other words, if we here in Muskegon decide to make a comment about, oh, that Washington Redskins football game, the federal government is now telling us, because some people were, quote, offended, that uh, they can shut down the show, they can take the license. Remember the show, Jim, that we did where we had the, the freedom of speech zones? Oh, yes. <laughs> where you can go stand inside. Like colleges, the... primarily. Oh, well, it, but it's all over. In many places. You all bet. over the United States. And, and I couldn't find a state without a freedom of speech zone, which was a, amounted to a, a snow fence in the middle of the desert that was you could go stand inside this little corral and say what was on your mind. But outside of that corral, it goes back to what I said. Socialism is just the politics of force. It may be the ugliest frame of of political ideology I've ever encountered. Well, let me just ask caller, uh, are you, it, do you live in the Grand Haven area? I do, actually. I live in Ferrysburg, so and, it's and in you, the Ottawa County area. Sure. Yeah. And, and you thought enough of the issue to call in. What, are you in contact with other people? Is there a kind of a, a groundswell of conversation going on down in Grand Haven? Well, you know, to be honest with you, I think people pretty much think it's ridiculous. I mean, it's, it's not hurting anyone. And me, personally, I feel that since this is being brought up, obviously, in the public eye now, who's to say that other people are going to say, well, you know, 
you're wearing baggy pants. That offends me. So I'm going to go ahead and try and make it change the city ordinance so you can't wear baggy pants. And so at what point does it stop? It, it goes, you're, you're exactly right. It goes in some of the examples to Jim's point is it goes where the, for instance, the high schoolers that were wearing um, T-shirts with American flag on them. That yep. offended people and must immediately be stopped. And I go, zig aisle. That's what it sounds like to me. I'm going, like I've been saying, where are the Nazis in the parking lot burning books? Because they reject right. an idea. They want to squelch it. And I thought, wow, are you really that insecure in whatever your belief structure is that you have to destroy other belief structures in, in the process? And here's how they may win. And this is, to me, the, the, the saddest part of the entire thing. They've, they may choose, in any of these examples that we've discussed, to, to uh, sue, uh, I, I mean the, um, uh, the no goodniks, if you will, may decide to sue. Then if the city fathers have to make a decision whether or not they're going to defend and spend taxpayers' money on these cases that, in some cases, may go all the way to the United States Supreme Court and, and it, in certain uh, smaller communities could even bankrupt the city or the, uh, the village. So there are issues here that are beyond um, simply putting up a banner, and uh, it's a bigger agenda, and uh, th- these folks are very, very well-funded. They may, may, they may triumph. Listen, we've got another caller. Thanks for calling in. I look forward to having you call in again. Thanks. Welcome to the Mike Hewitt Show. Who am I talking to? Hi, this is Gina Rinke calling from Grand Rapids. Hello, Gina Rinke. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Very nice. I know your name from Facebook. Yes, you do. It's nice to put a voice behind your name. Uh Uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. Hey, are you you listening to our show about all of these offended people over a cross? I am. What are your thoughts on that, Gina? Well, you know, it's my understanding that the people who who first raised this issue were people who were not even from the Grand Haven area. They came to Grand Haven, saw this cross and were offended by it, so offended that now they have, have raised the issue of it in Grand Haven, and it's ridiculous. Mm. I, you see this stuff going on all over the country. They were so offended. They don't like the cross. Yeah. yeah they were like the cross, so offended. They were so offended they reached out to, to a, um, uh, some kind of legalese group from Washington, D.C. That's really offended. I'd have just turned okay. my head. Well, yeah, if uh, you have the right of freedom of religion or freedom from it. If you don't like it, right. don't go to Grand Haven. It's really easy. Right, right. But you're, you're thinking reasonable, and some folks refuse to do that. Well, th- well, yeah, that's the left talking, though. I mean, we, we just, we, we have a different, we view things through a totally different lens, and that's the rational lens. Yeah, but there, wait rat- a sec, though. There, there, is a, there is another message here, and, and that quite simply is that if you are a municipality, and if, in fact, mm-hmm. you allow any religious display on your property, you're going to be sued, and that's going to be expensive. Now, the simple answer to that is to municipalities to say, well, we will just make a, a, just a broad generalization. We're not going to allow right. any religious-related displays, and that's, that simplifies it. That's legal. It, that's something they can, they can do. Yeah, but it that's doesn't. the ultimate goal of what these people want. But it doesn't simplify it. And let me tell you why. If, if I were an elected township supervisor, mm-hmm. and it was extraordinarily important to me to begin my meeting with a prayer, I, for someone to say you can't, it goes beyond it, it goes beyond them defending their rights. It goes to them insulting and attacking my rights. And Absolutely. In the First Amendment, when you read it, literally, I don't care about the wheelbarrow of nonsense they put on it. Right. It limited right. the federal government. It didn't limit me. It limited the government. I'm saying that the cities, the townships, the counties themselves, because they want to avoid lawsuits, this has nothing to do with any... Uh, constitutional issue, nothing to do with federal issues. Jim, this is the goal of what these folks want. They want to make sure that in order to avoid controversy, in order to avoid expense, that cities, townships, and counties invoke laws on their own, elected officials voting on their own, saying, look, we're just not going to have religious displays on our property. That is their goal. So what it means, then, is that the city no longer has has a choice of, of to, to literally lease a piece of property to anybody that has anything to do with if faith. If they do that, they will open themselves up to getting sued. The so, choice is, do you want to suffer so, that? So That's if I were if I were a Christian preacher, and forget church, I'm just an individual citizen that happens to be a preacher, and they got a piece of vacant land that I want to lease. 
What you're saying is that the city doesn't have the right to lease me, the preacher, a piece of land. Not at all. I'm saying you absolutely have the right, but they have the right to sue you. They cost you extra money. They're making. They're not beating us on constitutional issues. They are beating us using our own legal system in the same way that uh, uh, the enemies of the United States are beating us by suing us. As a matter of fact, didn't we just find out that just this last week that illegal immigrants are now suing because they don't like the Obamacare that they got? That is true. That you is know, true. Wait a minute here. Let's system. go back to the, let's go like back to the, to the founding them. file. Let's go back to the Pledge of Allegiance here. Aren't we one nation under <laughs> God? They didn't define, over almost half the founding fathers have, have degrees in theology. How, how, how is this? Go, this is straying so far from what our founding, founding fathers wanted for our country that it is embarrassing. And if you're not outraged by that, you should be. Each, each set of textbooks with every four, five, or six-year period spend more time either completely and absolutely evading our history to now the newest strategy they've un- unleashed. And with each, with each little uh, version update of the, of the textbooks, they leave out anything good that America has done and highlight anything that they perceive was negative. And well, like if you, if you saw what was going on in Jenison Public Schools just the other day, those, those kids under Common Core, some of those young children, were, all, were learning all about Islam. Yep. Okay? That's fine and dandy. You want to teach is- about Islam? That's fine. But why aren't you teaching about the Baptists? Why aren't you teaching about Protestants? Why aren't you teaching about the Catholics? That gets glossed over. Why Islam? Right. It's no different than I'd said in an earlier segment that we'll have this argument because of the public arena, and yet at least two, one in Ohio and one in Arizona, have both allow, allowed time for Muslim prayer, um, especially yeah. during um, Ramadan. But, so. you can't have, but you can't have Christian prayer in schools, and you can't have a cross on, on public property. Well, okay, what if I wanted to, to kneel down and pray on public property? Is somebody going to sue me for that? You might very that, well that be. That coming yeah. next? This is why we need to stand tall, and, and folks like you who have run for public office, and Mike, uh, we've got to stand tall, because the folks that want to change this world, this country, dramatically, um, are very tenacious, and they're using Absolutely. using our government as their biggest tool. i got to tell you, folks, we're, we're just about out of time, but to your final point, Jim, the America that, that, that the three of us and Oscar, four of, the four of us grew up in an America that doesn't exist anymore. So when, you say, when you say they want to change, i got to stop and say, oh, no, 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 they've changed it. The America with playing ball with your neighbor and going to church on Sunday, that America is gone. Now everything offends everybody and somebody's got a lawyer. Um, Gina, thank you very, very much for calling in. You're very welcome. I appreciate it's my you. pleasure. Yep, nice to yep. talk to you. Nice to hear your voice. Yeah, you too. Well, maybe we'll meet up soon. Very good. Thanks. All right. Folks, we'll talk next week. And in the meantime, find us on Facebook. You can do the forward slash The Mike Hewitt Show. You can find MikeHewitt.com. And uh, email me. Call me. Tell me what you want to talk about. We'll see you next week. Thanks, folks. <laughs>